get the right vibes going. But hello, hi everyone. I see folks are coming in, so welcome. Um, this is our panel, Design System Documentation is a Moving Target with Alberto with and Romina. Uh, we're gonna give folks like a minute or two to join the webinar in case they're coming from other meetings. Um, in the meantime, please share your name, what you do, and where you're joining us from in the chat, which it looks like Katrina already has done. So hello, and hello to Nicholas as well. It looks like we've got folks from around the world, which is fantastic. Virginia, Turkey, the Bay, France, Ohio, the UK, Prague, India, London, Denver, California, Colorado, Florida, Colombia, Charleston, Slovenia, Barcelona, Maine, Portugal, Germany, New Jersey, the Philippines, Sweden, Indonesia. Truly an international crew. Wow. It is a pleasure to meet you all. Well, let's get started. It looks like there's a great group of folks here. Um, to answer a question really quickly in the chat, this will be a panel, so only the panelists will be able to speak. But if you have any questions, please use the Q&A. Um, and I'll go over this again in a second. Um, so hello, welcome. So great to see so many of y'all joining us from around the world. I'm Jocelyn, the head of community at Supernova. And if you don't know, Supernova is an end-to-end -end design system platform where you can connect all your data sources, create customized documentation, and automate code delivery. Um, before we jump into our panel today, a few, ho a few housekeeping items. So one, the webinar is being recorded and it'll be shared with you all via email later this week. Um, you can also enable closed captioning um, or live transcription in case that's helpful. Um, and then you can also talk to other participants in the chat. Um, but if you have questions for our panelists, please use the Q&A the functionality or we may miss your question. Um, please also make sure to keep your questions related to the topic at hand. So we'll be specifically talking about design system documentation. And um, so just so you know, we will see those other questions. And if you have them about Supernova specifically, please reach out to our support team um, or um, you can reach out to us via email later on. But we want to be respectful of our panelists and keep this session specifically to design system documentation. And um, so there will be time at the end for those audience questions. So today we are joined by an incredible lineup of design system experts uh, to talk about all things design system documentation. So some of the things we'll be covering include challenges they face when creating and maintaining documentation, how they've overcome them, and so much more. So let's kick things off with a quick round of introductions. Um, if you all could share a little bit about yourself, including your name, preferred pronouns, what you currently do, or what you most recently did. Um, and then if you could also share a little bit about like the product your design system serves um, and where that documentation lives, would be fantastic. Um, and we'll just go in alphabetical order. So Alberto, if you want to kick us off. Sure. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm excited to be here. Um, uh, I'm Alberto. I'm based in, in Madrid, in, in Spain, and I currently work as a, a design infrastructure manager at MACE. Um, and back in the day, I worked at other uh, Pretty well known uh, uh, companies like uh, Sketch. Um, and yeah, I've been working on design system for the last uh, around five years. Uh, I got to connect my key. There's an awkward silence. <laughs> nice to meet you, Albert. Uh, hi, I'm uh, Luke Finch. I use he, him pronouns. Uh, I'm from Sussex in the UK. Um, previously, I worked at uh, News UK working on the news kit design system. Uh, I was there as a software engineer and a product designer uh, throughout my tenure at News. Um, recently I've moved into consulting, so now I'm a design systems and product design consultant uh, and I'm currently working with Token Studio. Hello, I'm Romina and I also work as a freelance design system lead. But currently I'm working with one scale up. Uh, it's a content delivery platform and we have, I mean, the design system serves more products. 
Um, but yeah, before I worked with a lot of different companies, maybe, you know, Stellar.org, I was uh, quite active in fintech space. But um, so I started with design systems, I think, 10 years ago with Prontify. And back then it was cool uh, already if you had a simple style guide. But now the design systems evolved, so a lot of cha things changed. Awesome. Thank you all so much for your introductions. Um, let's kind of dive in and start talking about design system documentation. Um, but as we do that, I think one thing that's really helpful is context. So what team, who on your team creates and owns that documentation? Is it owned by a specific person? Is it a team effort? What does that kind of look like for each of you? Or has it looked like for different teams in the past that you've been on? Maybe I'll break the ice. <laughs> uh, so uh, we have a team of three uh, person. We were four uh, before. We have a, a designer, uh, an engineer. We had a UX writer before um, and myself. So in terms of the documentation, we all uh, are owners of it. Uh, and we do the uh, we do it uh, collaboratively, so it's uh, it was kind of a challenge at the beginning uh, because our team was new uh, and no one on the team was uh, used to work uh, this way on on documentation. Uh, usually there was a, an owner for that, or people uh, were just uh, doing their best. But uh, yeah, I really thought that combining our forces uh, and our points of view uh, was going to make us stronger and it and it did uh, but yeah it took us a while to to adjust and uh, really understand where everyone can uh, contribute to to the documentation were there specific things or exercises that you all did to kind of get to that place where you felt like you all had co-ownership and can work at it well together um usually we have uh it's it comes from the from the designer the to kickstart the the documentation um but we are uh very involved in we have some milestones uh at uh, each uh, point of, in the in the process so uh in these milestones we do uh, some uh, regular checkups so we make sure everyone reads uh, what's being uh, documented and everyone agrees, uh, comments, because otherwise we, we had this problem that uh, uh, no one uh, paid full attention to what was being written. And uh, yeah, it didn't work really well for us. So we agreed to do uh, to commit to do these regular checkups every uh, 30, 60 and 90 percent uh, of the project, more or less. Uh, so we sit down and chat and discuss. We pre-read what uh, has been written and we ask questions and so forth. Awesome, thank you. Okay, well, I would like to say that uh, when you're starting out with design system, it's like um, ice cream in the summer, you know, when it's hot, everybody wants it. But then after a while, it starts dripping and nobody wants to take the responsibility because it's not so attractive. And I believe, I mean, we have centralized approach and it also comes down a bit uh, to culture. You know, I, f I believe that you should uh, be able to do whatever you're good at and also what you enjoy working. So I don't uh, like this rotating stuff where you put responsibility to people that are not so used to design system work especially when they are quite creative. Um, I can imagine that they would be operational. And I noticed that then later on, they also didn't do good work. They postponed it. It was quite slow or everything was half-baked. Um, so we actually have the process that once the designs were finished and confirmed, that uh, later on you talk, I mean, even in the meantime, you talk with developers and then the writer 
uh, writes the documentation. Um, and also this is opportune. I mean, there were a lot of opportunity costs if we did it in the different way, you know, because first we started with um, just having designers being able to take one day off from the regular product design work and then work on the design systems. But it was so much updates and um, feedback that everything was taking a lot of time. So a lot of opportunity costs. And this approach right now, it's of course, again, collective effort because you have to talk with everyone that's involved, but still people that are responsible to put that in documentation uh, know what to do and where to find and how to use the platform, etc. So it's much, much more effective. Yeah, it's a great call out that it really depends on the folks on your team, what people's strengths are, and then also what the culture is at your company. Yeah, I think I just agree with that, really. Um, so yeah, we had a centralized team, but the way you build that team is that ideally, you're, it's a bit like the Avengers, you're hiring like specialists in certain areas. Um, so yeah, we were fortunate to have a, a design systems team where you had people that are really great at accessibility, people that are really great at UX, people that are really good at front end code um, and all, all sort of the gamut of the design system. And so it's ultimately like when you've got those experts, tap into them. There's no point in just assigning one person to sit there and write all the time. Um, I do see the benefit in UX writers um, and being able to write in technical writers. Uh, we did have a contractor for a while that gave our docs a bit of a refresh, but ultimately, you know, the people documenting it should be the ones with the most knowledge in that area because that's going to be the most valuable writing. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a team effort, definitely. Um, yeah, it wasn't necessarily like one person wrote all those docs. I'd be curious to sort of ask like Romina and Alberto if um, like, but your documentation was that, like where, was that ticketed in like some like Jira or GitHub issues? Because we had, we had a, like, we went through like a scrum ban approach, right? Of you pick what ticket you want uh, and deliver it within the two weeks. And then our documentation was like ticketed. So you know, it became an impediment that it was a blocker to release something if you didn't document it. And so it basically became like writing those docs would be part of the work process that you had to do it to release it. I wonder if that was similar yes. to the others. Yeah, uh, yes. Uh, that's uh, how we approach things. Uh, uh, I heard this. Uh, thing at uh, github it's if it's not documented it doesn't exist uh so yeah uh documentation is there from day one practically so uh, it's a it's a whole process of uh, starting um writing uh, things down and also i mean the 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 um, the makers are the, the sp specific uh, consumers of the documentation, but it's also a great tool for us to um, define. I always say that uh, when you have to explain things and you have when you have to write things down, uh, it's when you start finding the cracks and when you start having this all these uh, uh, conversations about uh, what's working and what's not working. Uh, so yeah, for us, it's a iterative process, uh, and we are uh, the dedicated design system team is very very involved. We don't have the the ICs from the uh, feature pods; uh, they are not involved uh, actively in the in the documentation. Uh, but yeah, for us, it's a super iterative process. Yeah, the same for us. We also do tasks. Um, because that also forces you um, what's going on. You know, you can see the whole picture. Of course, there are some urgent tasks. I mean, not always something urgent comes up, but uh, no matter what, you can see what's going on. And also um, it forces people that are involved that they need to move on. Um, awesome. Thank you all so much. Um, and Zooming out a lot, maybe this is also a huge question. What are some of the biggest challenges you face when creating, updating, and maintaining documentation for design systems? I'm have to take the lead on this one. I think it's important to remember that like not everyone's a writer, but you know, everyone can be a contributor. Um, you know, we're we're working with remote teams, not everyone's like oh, we documented news in English. Um but yes, yeah, important to remember that you know, English isn't everybody's first language. Um, and so 
it's being able to distill some of that um, technical writing down into like plain English or yeah, what we call it, you know, plain English, like uh, not necessarily like um, simple English, but yeah, plain being like easy and understandable by everybody. Um, because I think one of the hard things when you're working design systems is you're covering the whole gamut of product design, right? From product managers we're reading your documentation, we're not like UX designers and covering that gamut in between of like UI front and back end developers that being able to create one paragraph that summarizes everything that everyone can understand and get the same value out of that or being able to like structure your information architecture within the whole like documentation system to, be able to point the right people to the right places um i think those two things are quite difficult um and then the other thing would be keeping stuff up to date is always difficult <laughs> um and figuring out how you prioritize that um i think we were pretty good at just raising bug tickets um, if something's wrong and you know you, you do bug tickets in the downtime when you're waiting for other people to review your PRs and stuff and it's just you know it's keeping yourself busy um, but again it's if it's not an issue it's nobody's aware of it so you've got to keep on top of actually writing those tickets um, but yeah I think I think those would be, be the main uh, challenges we sort of faced. <laughs> yeah I would say that um, I have two um, I mean, we have two that one is that you actually understand what your design system consumers need. So actually, what are their needs? How, uh, what are they going through? How can we help them? Where can we meet them? And also what's their current uh, process? And once you understand that, it's much easier to write a documentation. And, and the second challenge is quite connected with that. And I think it's uh, the chat GPT uh, problem because a lot of uh, companies right now think, okay, yeah, we have chat GPT, let's just ask some questions, copy paste the text and put everything there. Um, and of course, I mean, it can serve as a basis, of course, but design system consumers know what component is and what component does, but they don't understand the connections, you know? So it's very valuable, especially for designers when they start out, um, for example, if you want to do the payment flow, where can I find components? Um, how everything's connected? Will I break the conversion rate if I change the order, you know? So these connection snippets um, and helpful tips are the ones that are the hardest to do. And I think all oftentimes uh, forgotten because we just um, add a lot of essays and of course nobody wants to read that and you have to do more meetings because of that. So everything's, you know, uh, the process gets too long. Um, so yeah, I would advise that a lot of feedback, I mean, that you have more meetings before and then it's much, much easier to concisely um, get everything in one place. Yeah, on on our side, and it's very very connected with uh, what you uh, both said. Um, getting getting the structure right, we started. Uh, some people advised not to do this, but we started with the button, um, and yeah, we started writing documentation for for buttons, and it took us uh, a while to, as I said, is a multidisciplinary team. Uh, trying to contribute to the same uh, documentation, it's uh, it was a challenge uh, getting the the structure right, uh, writing like a huge uh, amount of text that nobody wants to read. But when you start, uh, yeah, you you want to make sense of one thing, and then we can start splitting uh, this content into uh, let's say patterns. Uh, things like that but we started with a button uh, it went really well to set the expectations for our team uh, on what's uh, a release candidate uh, button or documentation uh, for uh, for a component um, so yeah uh, right now we are starting to split uh, and making those connections that uh, you mentioned also uh, because uh, yeah, the, the value is in the in the in the connections of the of the system. That that's where the magic and the language, the design language or the experience language uh, lives. It's in the connections, or not in the in the individual parts. So uh, yeah, it took us a bit to to get the structure right. We we had to uh, iterate a, a little bit uh, on how to uh, structure th things properly. 
uh, and how to split content into more digestible bits. We're still on it. Thank you all. A lot of challenges, but it sounds like folks kind of face similar things. I'm also curious, like what are some strategies and practical um, tactics that you've implemented that have either addressed these challenges and you've like seen success or maybe even things that you've tried, but it didn't actually work for you all. I think that could also be really valuable for folks to hear. Well, I can say that uh, connected to my um, answer before, when you're doing, let's say, payment flow, um, we try to add more educational content, content so that's personalized. You know, so in Figma, you can add a lot of cool tips for designers, and then developers can add some more tips for coding. Um, but yeah, these are the most valuable things. We tried a lot of different approach, but still in Figma, I think it works uh, in the start. You know, and then later on, when you add documentation, you can add the same snippets there. Um, but that's just really practical. You know, if you want to do um, this flow, you can refer back to this site here and you add the landing page. And I think that was, I mean, throughout my uh, career, the most helpful things. And it has the least uh, amount of meetings afterwards. Um, but I also like to specify all the steps. So once the process is done, uh, I mean, the process is in place, um, we have to follow it. And then that doesn't mean that it's set in stone after you have a lot of feedback and once per quarter, you go back and re retrospectively see if things work. If they don't work, you change them, you know. Um, so yeah, this kind of flexibility gives you the ability to also go one step further and that you're not set in stone you know for forever in the same process i think process is a really interesting thing there so like just pick up on that like i think when you get into doing design systems right you you're doing the same thing over and over again it's just slightly different each time um but you know you have a run book of how you actually build a component in the end so that you know starts with like the business need or like the usage gap right why do we need this component um and that you know it's i think everything you do when you work in design system to some degree is a form of documentation um like you know they're called documents <laughs> like a figma file is a document um a confluence page is a document you know um any piece of code that you write is a document to some degree um i think we think of documentation as this sort of magical uh wiki site or you know part of supernova or maybe you've on your own or use a competitor or whatever you do right every, every piece of work you do to some degree is documentation um and so every spike you do as an engineer or a designer working design system you're writing up a report on what that spike is um and then you know from that spike you have a technical technical analysis some takes minutes in that meeting you understand what everyone understands doesn't understand that goes into creating specs. You build, you build out a design. You figure out what you need there. You do an accessibility investigation. You know, you everything you're doing along this process is creating some form of document. Um, and then the real craft is being able to distill that into what you then make the sort of public facing documentation. So, like, fully admit, our internal documentation is ugly, um, but it's understandable to some degree um you know we're a small team that's pretty close knit um i know i could always ask uh mike who was one of our uh, ux engineers uh well, ux designers sorry um you know where does this live um and you dig out an old um spec document but yeah the real craft is being able to distill all that information back into something that's public facing um and i think yeah it's just following a process uh, and that process builds up your documentation over time um but yeah you do your specs do your spikes um demo and feedback it uh, i think that's really important as well you know get people involved early uh, to understand what's going on um and read read your documentation see if they understand it get feedback change it um you know these they're living things so it's easy to update um i think that'd be sort of the main thing the only other tip i've really got on uh overcome challenges is make make it easy to edit um we had a we had a hackathon day essentially or a dockathon um where all of our uh ux and ui designers wrote documentation 
and most of that day was teaching them how to use github um and i <laughs> i didn't get any work done because <laughs> uh, i was teaching them how to use github all day um but yeah i think i've started using like nextra um at token studio at the new gig if you want to edit docs there's just a button that says edit in place it takes you to github you can write write some new words in fix some spelling mistakes raise a pr it's really simple um I think being able to streamline processes as much as possible, um, I think really helps process that. Yeah, in, in our case, uh, yeah, we, what we did is uh, starting to systemize uh, or systematize our documentation, uh, uh, the blocks, the structure, uh, how we use uh, certain things, uh, because uh, yes, many people are um, touching the documentation. How are we communicating? Uh, uh, the overview, the uh, anatomy of the component, how to links, and try to leverage as much as we can uh, Supernova. We use Supernova at Mace uh, because it can automate a, a lot of things uh, with the components table. Uh, it's magical. We 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 spend a fair amount of time like tweaking all this and having all this uh, automated. Uh, but yeah, it was uh, more like uh, try what things work and what things don't work. Uh, also, hack. Uh, I always and, and Giri, uh, Supernova CEO, always makes fun of me because I always I'm always hacking Supernova with CSS. Um, so yeah, trying to find the the best ways uh, of uh, communicating things. Uh, try new things and then scale that to other sections of the docs. I know process was mentioned a couple of times here and some of the Q&A questions also asked about like developer versus design documentation. So I'd love to dive more into the nitty gritty of what does this process actually look like for some of you all. Um, is it like a regular editorial flow where somebody writes a first draft, there's an editor who edits it, and then you like review and then publish? Or can anyone just like draft something and then hit the publish button? Can anyone edit? Like, what does that practically look like? Are there any like guardrails in place or uh, back and forth editing to really get that succinct um, public facing documentation? And then does it differ between design and technical documentation? I mean, yeah, in our case, it's more like in the editorial. So you make a first draft, you put it to developers, designers, everyone that's involved, also to motion, and then you can see if they agree, if they have to add some more stuff or helpful tips, and then it goes back. Um, we see if things work, and then you hit the publish. Um, I mean, technical documentation that's um, public, it's a bit different um, because it's public. But we do this only internally, you know, we, our design system is internal, it's not public. So maybe that's a bit different. Even if you hit the publish and something's wrong, you can always update it. Um, but yeah, it's not for everyone. We don't expect designers to write the documentation and then put it up there um, unless they want to. Sounds good. In in our case, um, yeah, as, as I said, the, the designer usually is the one uh, who starts the uh, writing the docs, but then we get the very involved in in the in the process. Our documentation is really for anyone; it's, it's made for anyone uh, at Mace. Uh, so any makers or any uh, marketers, any anyone on at Mace can uh, check what we are doing and trying to understand um, why we make certain decisions. Uh, so it's it's very open. Um, one thing I miss, and we need to uh, get into that, is having more life examples and code examples. This is something that developers are asking for because uh, the, the docs are, I would say, or hopefully pretty straightforward for anyone to follow. Uh, but uh, having real world examples, we have some Figma, do's and don'ts and all that, but uh, yeah, devs want uh, uh, live examples and we are working on, on that right now. 
yeah i think those live examples are so useful like yeah um we we made the choice to not have separate design and developer docs um i think personally there's you know, somebody that sits on both <laughs> both sides um i want to understand it from both angles um i think all it does really is further create that divide between the two disciplines um and i think design systems are that sort of holy land where everyone does a little bit of everything anyway um you know it's you've got to have a solid technical understanding of what that component is to be able to design it anyway um i don't it's it's slightly different compared to when you're working on product design and you're composing screens and handing it over i think in the design systems realm you really need a deep technical understanding of what this thing is um because it's such like a a, mac, a micro view on like a component that you're really zoomed in um the, yeah, i think yeah we kept kept it um like together in that case um i can't remember where the point was but i'm just gonna end it there because i forgot exactly what i was gonna say in the, in the follow-up to that but um <laughs> yeah maybe i'll read my notes and come back to you <laughs> all good that's perfect um and I know also in the challenge and just earlier in the conversation, one thing that was brought up is keeping documentation updated. It can design systems sexy at the beginning and then people kind of lose interest sometimes. So how do you guys prioritize um, what to update first? And then also how do you communicate those changes to your future teams? I'll dive on that one before I forget again. <laughs> um, yeah, I think the first thing is um build up good relationships with the people using your design system um we ran clinics um and the first point of call would always be to push somebody to the docs um you know it's easier to have somebody read <laughs> than to actually spend time with them you know, in terms of like you know cost of running a business um if you've written that documentation point people to it um and then yeah the system there is if that documentation is not serving you you don't understand it well enough um tell me like if you don't understand after you've read everything tell me and we'll fix it what didn't you understand and have a really deep dive into that um and know it's essentially like usability testing like you do on a, any sort of um product it's usability test your docs to some degree um have really solid examples um and have people run through can you can you spec out a design using these components that we've just created can, does it have all the props you need etc cetera, etc cetera. um like do you, after you're working with it do you understand it better um and then it, you know, make, make a note of everything they don't understand. Um, use that time, sit, sit down, actually help them <laughs> at that point, you know, be a good human being, but also make a note of everything you've helped them with um, and cover those knowledge gaps. Uh, I think that'd be the most practical advice there. Um, yeah, just understand their needs and prioritize what serves them best. I think that's the best way to prioritize what to update first. And also just any, anytime you notice a spelling mistake, something like that, which will always come across, um, just fix it. Well, like, it, ta it takes five minutes. <laughs> um, fix it, raise a PR, share it in the code review channel, say I'll fix this docs. Um, and yeah, I think that's one of the most practical approaches there. Yeah, I would say that you need to know what are we optimizing for when you know when you know that, then it's much, much easier. And there is also a need to know where the product is, you know, so you think the design system tasks and also what where the product is because if you see that they are launching something new and they need specific components and also documentation for that of course you will see that there is a high impact and um, it's much easier than to speed up those tasks to put them up there um, so i would say it's always a mix of urgent important valuable and connected with business objectives um, but yeah like I said in the beginning, I think the reality always kicks in and you have these little arrows that break your timeline. But at least if you have um, the vision and these tasks connected, I think it's much easier than to see what tasks will bring the most impact. Yeah, I, I agree. In our case, uh, the documentation is a top priority. I would say that the docs are our most important asset probably um but yeah we have several uh, mechanisms we have uh, of course a dedicated slack channel to communicate these uh, uh, new features or uh, changes and things like that uh, but also it's very important as Luke said 
uh, meeting people where they are. Uh, we have uh, dedicated jam sessions. We have uh, office hours weekly. Uh, and we have uh, also a design system blue every month uh, to communicate and discuss changes with the team, uh, gather ideas uh, and see what things are working and what things, uh, which things aren't working. Uh, so yeah, that's pretty much how we do communicate uh, our uh, updates. We also use Loom where you can record product update and you send it every week what was going on because uh, it's a remote company and then it's really hard to catch everyone and to also expect that they will join this meeting. So it's easier to share the Loom link. But yeah, we have this monthly live, let's say Q&A where they can also ask questions. But some of the tasks are also connected with the Slack channel. So if you do, if you do something, the team automatically is updated in Slack, you know, so this kind of stuff helps you to be in line with everyone. Yes, I, I used to do videos in my previous company. Uh, and yeah, people always uh, make fun of me uh, of these videos. Uh, but yeah, it were they were really useful. Uh, we are not doing this uh, at Maze. Uh, but we uh, we discussed uh, the idea of doing some like live demos uh, how how to use these components. Uh, those uh, my learning from that is that, that people usually consume these videos when they need them and not when you publish them. Uh, but yeah, I I miss I miss doing some some video content. It was really awesome. I do think that's always a problem with like design systems is that you're always out of sync with user needs. Um, like you're working something and it's just like shouting to the void sometimes like, Hey, we just released this feature and here's everything that we've documented for the last like six weeks. And you know, nobody cares. Um, and then six months later, um, somebody go, Hey, I need that component that you built six months ago. Um, how does it work? So I think it just, it shows the importance of your docs because Chances are, like, I mean, I memory, memory are like a goldfish. I'm like, I'll forget what I've done six months ago. So, you know, writing it down the first time and actually documenting it is really important because, you know, it's documentation is as much for maintainers as it is for consumers. Um, so, yeah, make, make it so you can understand it as well as your consumers. Um, and yeah, it's a, it's a cheat sheet when somebody does ask you a question six months later. Um, but yeah, it's always, you're always going to be out of sync. So it's a real struggle to get that initial feedback, I think. Um, and it's, yeah, ha figure out how your um your process of feedback works and makes that as streamlined as possible and easy for people to tell you stuff. Um, that yeah, yeah, it's, you're never going to be able to get nail it within the first week of release <laughs> um, because no nobody's that excited for a new component. Um, it's always when they need it, not when they, not when it's like new and shiny. In a similar vein, um, how do you all? measure qualitatively or quantitatively like the success or the usefulness um, of your documentation? How do you know it's helpful for folks? Yeah, and then we come back to this connecting with all your mates. <laughs> you have to, I mean, I like to say that you are rotating to different departments and you spend some more time with them, even if it's online and you see how they, um, use the documentation, what they lack. So it's a combination of one-on-one -on -one interviews and also feedback that you get from the surveys, internal surveys. Um, and then it's much easier to also update according to their needs. Um, so yeah, we are not tracking this quantitatively because I think it would be hard, but it's much, much easier to see if the, the document, when once you started the documentation, and after a while, if this helps them, you know, um, if you meet them where they are, I think the results are always positive. I mean, I heard a lot of times that they have this um, NPS score, like internal NPS score, but this is also quite subjective, you know. So if you understand, once you're talking with people and you understand specifically what each department needs, that's the most valuable feedback. Yeah, I think it's it's similar to kind of research, right? Um, 
if speak to people as much as possible uh, and get as much feedback as you can. Um, I do think that there's, there's an element of, um, you know, coming from like a background of doing like UX and UI, like you speak to users and the users that speak back to you are always the vocal ones. Um, so you get, you get false positives a lot of the time, like the bias of, you know, you can write a persona of everyone that fills out a survey and the, the persona is I'm somebody that likes filling out surveys. Um, it's a, a really kind of um, difficult thing to understand, like, is that documentation serving everybody? But um, I think getting to, to, like, getting yourself speaking to people that aren't as vocal. Um, one of our UX designers, uh, again, Mike, like, just organized one-to-one -one interviews with um, pseudo-random people, um, you know, people that, people that were agreeable and would actually be helpful. But, you know, it's, I think sending out surveys, you're not going to get all the responses you need. It's going to be very biased. Um, you've got to gather as many feedback points as you can for your documentation. Um, I think the idea of some like ethnographic studies or you know spying on your teammates uh, <laughs> to be a bit a bit more uh, transparent. I think you know one of the good things um, that we've got like now that I think the industry sort of made a bit of a cultural shift to Figma um, is design is a lot more open. Um, you can see what people are doing um, that you couldn't necessarily see before. So it's it's a lot easier to get a general feel of um, how everyone's working uh, and then it's not necessarily like oh, are our docs really good it's is everyone working really good and then if everyone's working really good the docs kind of don't matter or they know it's, it's what they're one of the same that if everyone understands what they're doing and how to work then our docs are doing good and so I think you've got to look for the other indicators of what shows your docs are really good rather than asking somebody oh, are our docs good and then they're probably going to say yes because you'll buy them a beer or no because they're grumpy um, <laughs> but you've got to look for the other indicators that show the health of your design system um, rather than just sending out a survey, I think, personally. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree. Uh, we've been there uh, as well. Our design system is uh, pretty new. Um, so uh, we tried the service and, and they didn't work uh, really well. So uh, I agree that uh, the best way you, you can uh, measure that is uh, go and uh, in, Go where people are, are working on and try to uh, understand whether they are fully uh, getting uh, what they need from the from the docs and from the also from the components of course um, and yeah yeah it's uh, pretty much uh, like that and trying to understand whether the components are used uh, in the way that are meant to be uh, used uh, or uh, uh, you're getting some rogue use cases. Why? Why is that? Is the documentation not clear enough? Uh, is the component not uh, serving your needs? Uh, so yeah, it's mostly uh, talking to people. Yeah, it's like having a product. If you have a lot of support calls, then something's wrong. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Thank you all. Well, that's all the questions that I prepared. And we have about 15 minutes left and about 15 questions. Um, so we can jump into the audience questions. Um, as a reminder for our audience, if you have any questions, please share them directly in the Q&A section of Zoom. And you can also upvote any of the questions that you like or you also have. And we'll try to get to as many as possible. If we don't get to any of them, the panelists have graciously agreed to answer them via a blog post later on. Um, so the first question is, how do you recommend doing versioning and governance? It's a big one. Of uh, documentation, I think somebody asked me this earlier when I was prepping for this um, and said, that, yeah, do you, do you version your docs? Um, and I think it's a weird one in that you can't be on top of everything all at once um and so ideally you know there's there's kind of like three artifacts of a design system right you've got the documentation the component library in your code framework whether you're using react angular view etc and then the design metaphor that represents that and so usually a figma file or a sketch file or xd rip kind of thing but trying to keep all of those things in sync right where you've got your docs your front end architecture and the design files all in sync at once trying to version that is just a mammoth task and i don't think you can throw enough money and people at the problem to manage that 
Um, and so it's like, I mean, you know, the title of the webinar is Design System Documentation is a Moving Target. Hell yeah, it is. Everything's a moving target in design systems. It's trying to keep up to date as much as possible. Um, and I think it's easier when you manage it in slices, right? So let's update our Figma component library and our docs and the front end component library all in sync as much as possible. Um, and so that will kind of be like some form of like semantic version maybe, but you know, you only really need Semver for your node package or whatever other sort of package manager you're using. Nobody really cares about it in Figma um, because it just sort of happens in the background. Uh, and then your docs, people just like going to your docs URL that they're always gonna get the latest thing. Nobody's really digging through the archives. Um, that it's just easier to urge people just to use the latest version because it's easier for everyone to maintain um, because you can't expect somebody to ask a question around, oh, I'm using, you know, the design system version 0 .0 0.0.1. Uh, how does this thing work? And it's like, well, we're on version 7 now. Why haven't you updated? Um, it's, you know, keep people moving with it. Um, document stuff live. Um, let's not worry about <laughs> documenting old things. Um, just work on latest. And that's what you really need to do with docs, in my opinion. Yeah, I totally agree. I think that documentation should, there's only one version, the latest. You can, of course, add logs so you can see what you updated. Um, but for Figma, if we're talking about um, versioning, there is always one version. You can always make a backup, but um, if your component is not used anymore, you can just add a mass, a default option as deprecated or some rectangle above, above it, you know, so everyone can see it's not used, even if you try to add it to your designs. Um, but otherwise, you can add a special remark to your documentation. Um, yeah, I wouldn't advise versioning because then people would be confused. Yeah. Uh, same, same here. Especially for for the for the docs, uh, I think we all want to get everything uh, out there as soon as we can. So we are not holding. I mean, when we write uh, new component documentation, then we hide it uh, until it's published. But other than that, we we don't uh, version uh, documentation. Maybe maybe if we had a bigger team, maybe that would become uh, an issue. But right now, uh, yeah, I wouldn't advise uh, spending too much time on uh, versioning um, on versioning the docs uh, on the code side. Of course, we do have Semver and we use that. Uh, and I tried to introduce Semver uh, in Figma uh, as well, but it didn't work really well. It worked really well uh, in my previous company because I was the only one doing changes. Uh, but uh, in here, uh, feels like we don't need it either. Uh, we have a really strong communication, uh, so it's not very likely that we are going to break and also we have uh, the, the Figma versioning system so we can roll out changes. We have uh, libraries split uh, in different files. So um, yeah, it's uh, it's it, it's work, it, it works uh, out of the box. Awesome, thank you all. Um, the next question is, does it make sense to have design system documentation and UX writing place yes <laughs> i'm gonna uh, answer this one uh 100 yes uh i don't uh, understand uh design system without uh ux writing there's something that i learned in my previous company and i uh, totally recommend uh, anyone to get the help of a ux writer because uh yeah otherwise to me uh ads is incomplete is uh, as if uh, we didn't have design or uh, code. Uh, most of, uh, I mean, the mo or, or one of the most important parts of the experience are the words. Uh, so yeah, I I can't understand that design system without UX writing. I totally agree. <laughs> because they know how to use words and what how to persuade people. Uh, what will come out best, etc. 
don't think I understand the question. <laughs> um, <laughs> are, we ask, are we asking, should UX writers sit on design system teams? Um, in which case, maybe, if that's a business need. Um, you know, I worked on multi-brand design systems that, um, you know, for context, News UK has two very different newspapers as their flagship brands. And then you've got a tabloid that's a bit sweary and shouty, and then a very reserved, conservative um, broadsheet. The, you know, the, the UX writing of those, if you're talking about what a customer sees in terms of your UX writing, will be very different. Um, and therefore, the layers of abstraction that your design system serves multiple products. And so you've got like the, the layers of the onion um, go further out that those things don't necessarily live together. Um, but then as a design system, we'd provide advice on like patterns and how's best to write that copy um, that serves every user. And then, you know, somebody in marketing would add a flare and ruin it anyway. But um, yeah, <laughs> um, I don't necessarily think that UX writing should always with the design system. It should sit with the product. Um, but if if your product if your design system only serves one product, then those things become so incestuous anyway that it doesn't really matter where it lives as long as it's somewhere. <laughs> Personally, thank you. Um, the next question is about um, component documentation for developers. So broadly, if you all could speak to your experience with that, and then also talk about what is the fidelity of the documentation you have? What does it usually include? And how do you define component properties and component names? Oh, I can take the charge on this one. <laughs> um, that's a tough one, right? There's Slack channels dedicated to naming things as hard in the design system Slack. Um, but I think, you know, the main thing is when you're naming properties and components is make them consistent. Um, if, a, you know, the, the state of a button um, is probably the same as the state of the icon button, um, you end up having your sort of like list of keywords um, that you're using internally anyway. Um, you know, that probably differs between system to system, between different companies. Um, you know, it's kind of like Conway's laws, right? We build our own um systems of communication that reflect our business um but ultimately the main thing is that they make sense to users um and so you know some sometimes you have to bite your tongue a little bit and you know when you think something should be called one thing and somebody else says it's another um just go with the majority um be kind of diplomatic with that um and then in terms of documenting those um we had these things called like prop tables. Um, if you look at any of the news kit um, documentation, I'll share a link later, but any of those components basically has like a table of all the different properties and all the different values that they can be. Um, so like a button might have like size and that'd be like small, medium and large. And obviously you know, size and small, medium and large go together and those become like things you repeat that you build up a knowledge of what your internal um, prop names and value names are. Um, but yeah, it's just making sure that those uh, short and make sense um and then i think one of the good things about um at least working in javascript you know is typing um if you're building components use typescript if you're in a um, javascript environment it documents itself to some degree um and uses intellisense but a lot of the time when you're building out these components it will give you those suggestions anyway um that you don't always have to refer back to the docs um but yeah does that answer that question? I realize I waffle and then forget what the question is. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think I think that answers it. Um, use sensible component names, um, use types. Um, it makes things easier. Uh, and repeat patterns, use prop tables. Those would be my three pieces of advice there. Um, in our case, uh, we, we define these uh, props together uh with the the engineer and the designer we we make an agreement on what are the props uh names and uh, we have so, so many arguments about uh, naming as you <laughs> probably are familiar with um uh, so yeah we have also uh prop tables in our documentation one thing i miss and and this is something uh, related to uh, having one single source of truth for uh, for everything 
is that we only have in our uh, existing docs, we only have the props that are shared between design and development, but the devs have a lot more properties that we are not yet including in the docs. Uh, like area properties, things like that uh, are not uh, fully documented. Uh, they are in storybook, but uh, we want to kill storybook. Uh, so it's just for other purposes, not for documenting stuff. Uh, and we want to have everything uh, in in supernova. But uh, yeah, so far uh, we haven't uh, uh, achieved uh, this. Yeah, I would say that we have a similar challenge with Storybook because developers love their playground um, and they want to have, I mean, of course, it's understandable. They want to test everything there and they have more props there, but uh, then it's hard sometimes to sync everything. But uh, the question was, yeah, how many things should we add to documentation? I think as many connections as possible, like we already mentioned. So if it's a component, add description, add code snippets, add live view, so it's visible where it's used. And then also connect props, of course, best practices, do's and don'ts, blah, blah. Um, and connections, let's say, if I refer back to the payment flow, where can I find these components and how can I actually combine components together? So I wouldn't advise because I also saw that when question is connected with this, should these patterns be part of the documentation? I think not as glued together, but it's cool to add best practices how to connect those components. Um, and I think it works best. I mean, that's my experience. Somebody might have a different one, but it works for us. Yeah, so the question Romina was referencing to when somebody asked, does it make sense to have component ties, patterns, or templates? Would you consider that a part of your design system? We did. Um, nothing, partly the decision there was down to sort of like design maturity across the business or where sort of knowledge lies. Um, you know, we tried doing a multi-brand design system that would eventually let us white label of our products. And so you kind of needed to indoctrinate everybody to think the same way. Um, and so, you know, what we call like best practice is often usually the easy way out. Um, <laughs> and the, if everyone agrees to what best practice is, um, it's much easier to white label those things. Um, and so we did, show some patterns there uh also just you know it's the repeat questions you get sort of in the design channel in slack it's what's the best way to design this form um what do i need what I need to ask for and that ties into especially now with things like gdpr and ccpa in those sort of areas um there is a best practice um accessibility also is best practice um the in a document in those patterns or i think keeping them somewhat loose um you know it's guidance not go um, not um indoctrination as such um i think pointing people you know a simple do's and don'ts list i think is mostly all you need for patterns um i think if people are asking like patterns around like you know here's a pre-built form um we did those things too documentation in like um adoption didn't go so great on those um because people didn't tweak them but i think keep your design system as sort of like low level as possible and give people the building blocks to compose what they need um, would be my advice there. Alberto, was there anything you wanted to add to that question? No, yeah, building, building blocks is a cool word, you know, you can always build upon. <laughs> yeah, on, on our side, we are, um, we have started working on on some some patterns, uh, and I see a question uh, in the QI uh, related to to patterns on what I mentioned before uh, about the patterns documentation and the patterns. Uh, to set an example, so uh, we have in inside the button guidelines, we have uh, guidelines for uh, disabling. Uh, buttons or not disabling buttons that that's what we recommend uh, to do uh, so what we plan to do is to move that because we get that question often uh, move that uh, 
part of the uh, component uh, documentation to a pattern section because it's really a pattern um, like having uh, why you shouldn't be disabling buttons uh, try to rely on um, uh, on the form validation uh, provide feedback in, in other ways uh, because otherwise people are lost so yeah we started also uh, on working on uh, uh, ux writing uh, text patterns uh, and this uh, has been uh, really helpful for us um uh, but yeah it's, it's still in diapers uh, but we plan to uh, keep growing that uh, as we go and yeah as as Luke said it's uh, it reflects the, the maturity or uh, how much support does your team need to build these uh, patterns uh, are they doing it uh, uh, correctly without any guidance or do they need some more guidance do we need, do they need some, some more support on how to build specific uh, patterns uh, so yeah that's where we are still in diapers in patterns but uh, we'll probably Mm. very likely more uh, next year than this year because we are still building uh, the most uh, basic parts of the of the system we don't have uh, full coverage as well uh, uh, yet uh, but uh, yeah awesome thank you all so much i know we are actually over time right now um so really appreciate you all thank you so much for our audience for tuning in and an extra thank you to you all for sharing your hard-earned wisdom and advice. As a reminder, we'll be sharing a recording of this panel via email later this week. Um, and we'll also work with you all to answer any of the remaining questions. Or if you want to dive deeper into some of the stuff you talked about, we can put that in the blog post. So thank you all so much for attending and have a great rest of your day. Thank you all for coming and listening. Thanks, everyone. A pleasure. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.